Welcome to the Mind Speaking Podcast, where we talk about the human side of data. In other words, data, communication, and personal development. My name is Gilbert Eikelebo. I'm driven by curiosity, and my aim is to spread insights that you can apply in your life starting today. So, let's do it. Let's start Mind Speaking. Hello, everyone. I'm excited for this conversation. This conversation with Brent Dykes. Brent is the author of Effective Data Storytelling. It's a great book. I recommend it to everyone. He's also the founder and chief data storyteller at Analytics Hero. He's worked in analytics over the last 16 years and he has an MBA in marketing. That's something we talk about in the podcast. He has published more than 35 Forbes articles and spoken on the largest conferences around the globe. And throughout his journey, he worked with the he has worked with the biggest brands in the world, like Nike, Amazon, Microsoft, Sony, and Comcast. And in a conversation of today, we talk about how to present your data. What's the difference between storytelling and story framing? Also, we speak about how you can change people's minds, even if they have an opposite view, and how to present your data to executives who don't have as much time how you can use a data trailer to pique their interest. And also how leaders can grow a culture of data storytelling. So a lot of insights, a lot of good conversation of today. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. Let's dive right in. Hi Brent, welcome. I'm so excited to talk to you again. We share a passion in data storytelling. And of course, that's what we're we're gonna talk about today. But I also want to know a bit more about you, uh, because I think that's also what people are interested in. And before we dive into your career, I want to go back a bit more, going back to your childhood. And I'm curious, because we speak about a, a lot about development, personal development on this podcast. What type of person was Brent Dykes in high school? I was probably a nerd. I was probably a socially awkward um... I really just wanted to survive high school. I, I didn't really enjoy high school. I, you know, I, I did okay in my classes. I got B's. Uh, I didn't really apply myself, uh, and I really just wanted to move on from high school. So um, I don't I have a ton of fond memories of high school. Um, I, I think that more. I survive. I just don't stand out. Don't don't do anything you know silly and don't do anything that's going to get you picked on or anything like that. Um, just survive, you know. And, and and so I I did a lot of computer gaming. I liked you know playing with my Commodore sixty four, um, and and that was probably a big thing. I enjoyed skiing, so I'd go skiing. I, I grew up in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, Canada. And so uh, often we'd go skiing. Uh, I love hockey. I wasn't a hockey player, though. I wish I could say I was a hockey player, but I I did not get tall until I was uh, in the 12th grade. And so that didn't really help my uh, chances right, of being an right. athlete. So And and after yeah. you, you started your, yeah, at the end, you started your career. Uh, now you talk a lot about data storytelling, but actually your background is in marketing, right? You, you write in your LinkedIn yeah. profile that you're deep down, you're still a marketer at heart. And what I find interesting about that is, or, or what, what I would like to understand is, because many people in data think marketing is a fluffy business area or it doesn't really matter. Um, I've, I've seen those comments in the past on LinkedIn and other areas. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I, when, when I started, when I was in the last you know, year or two of my, um, of my studies, and you know, I was studying business administration, at Simon Fraser University in Canada. And I was deciding between accounting and marketing. And I was good at accounting, which for most people that would be, oh, then you definitely go into accounting because there's it's a safe career. You're, you're not gonna have too many issues finding a job. Whereas I think that perception that marketing is a little bit more fluffy, a little bit more squishy, and probably not as safe an option. But I, I really wasn't passionate about counting other people's money. And so I decided to go into marketing because I really, the one thing that I really enjoyed, I enjoyed a lot of my psychology classes and I liked how psychology overlapped with marketing. So you have consumer behavior and they apply a lot of these psychology kind of 
principles there. And so that really appealed to me. I love that that part of it, my dad was in public relations, and so I got a little bit of exposure indirectly to marketing. And at the time, honestly, data wasn't really a big thing with marketing. Um, the only uh, discipline within marketing that you could actually play with data was in market research. And I was talking to another uh, person who graduated with a marketing degree at the same time as I did, and her professor told her, how do you want to make the least amount of money in marketing? Go into market research. Um, and that, would, that was probably, I would say that's pretty, pretty fair uh, assessment of, of where data and marketing was at the time. However, I would say once I got into marketing and then I did my MBA, uh, I got into uh, digital analytics or web analytics as it was called at the time. And that was really where marketers now had lots of data on their campaigns, lots of data on their SEO, lots of data on all of the marketing channels. And, and even today, I mean, marketers have so much data, so much, so many numbers to, to play with and to analyze and, and hopefully tell data stories with. Uh, but that was, that was a transformation for me because I could apply all of the stuff I love around marketing with the numbers. And, and so getting into marketing analytics or digital analytics for me was a was a, a godsend because I was able to pair those two interests together. And then that's what started me down the path of data storytelling. Cause at the end of the day, yeah, you can have an insight, but if you're not able to communicate that insight effectively or clearly, uh, then that's, you know, no action mm -hmm. will be right. taken on that. Yeah, insight, and I'm sure and that, that becomes that a problem. Psychology so, interest yeah. and, and knowledge you've built over the years can also come in handy while telling stories with data and talking to stakeholders to understand how they make their decisions and how they, how you can influence them with, with storytelling. Absolutely. And I, I would say when I started getting into to analytics, I, I may have looked past a lot of the psychology of decision-making and how that influences us and how we look at data and process it. And so it was almost like a, uh, a, a renaissance or a, a, you know, kind of a rejuvenation of the psychology aspects. Because as I was writing my book, I realized a lot of people would say, oh, do this or do that because it, it works. And I, I, in, in my mind, I think I'm curious. And, but why? Why does it work that way? And that was part of, you know, what I wanted to get into with my book is I want to understand why these things work the way they do. Why is it good to tell stories? Why, is, why are visuals effective? Why do we sometimes ignore the data and just trust our gut? You know, why are these things, why do we work this way? And, and I think that was an important thing to look into and, and understand because at the end of the day, we want people to take action on our insights. And if we can't commit, connect with them or if we can't communicate our ideas effectively, then um, again, like I said yeah, earlier, our, exactly. our insights will go and nowhere. I, I and I like that you mentioned curiosity, that you're a curious person. Do you think on average, data professionals are curious enough, or how can they can they foster their curiosity or or bring it to to the to the workplace? How can they put it in practice, so to say? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are some people that are naturally just more curious than others, but I think in general, human beings are curious by nature, especially if we can get our uh, if something can pique our interest and and, and hold it potentially. I, I've, I've worked with a lot of internet uh, analytics professionals over, over the years, and sometimes I've seen on the reporting side, and maybe a little bit on the, on the data uh, setup side, maybe data engineering or other professions, sometimes it's more just taking a number, uh, almost like a short order cook, filling that order, and then moving on to the next one. And there's no curiosity there's no question. Why are you asking for that data? Why do you want to know that number? And, and I think that's an important thing to, to do as analytics professionals or as data professionals, because sometimes, you know, you'll get a, a prescription from the business, right? They'll say, fill this prescription. And then you're like, but why do you need this pain? Why do you need these pain meds? Well, it's because, you know, I've got this pain in my back. And then, you know, and then you turn them around and they've got something sticking out of their back. It's okay. I can give you this medicine or we can just remove this stick that's sticking out of your back. I mean, that's kind of a, a terrible analogy, but basically sometimes what, what happens is the business comes to us with, I need this data 
and we don't ask the question why. We just, oh, okay, here's the data. And I think that's the wrong approach. I think we, we also should say, well, why do you need this data? What are you trying to solve? What are, what are the questions you're trying to answer? And it may be like, actually, that data is not what you need. You need this data. Or we don't even have that data. We need to go collect that data for you uh, or, or different things like that. I think the, the curiosity starts right there. And then obviously, if you have the data, then, you know, I, I, and it's hard to, it's like the curse of knowledge, right? If you, if you are somebody who's curious, it's hard to not be curious. But, you know, if, if I'm looking at data, I, I get curious. I want to know what's, you know, what's happening, what's causing it, uh, what's, what's, what is it contributing to, what are the other factors? And, and so I just naturally get curious um, but that, but that is something I think is a skill that we need to develop in people. And, and I think stories, data stories, going back to data stories, I think they can be a conduit for getting people's interest in the data and in the business, increasing that, that curiosity. Because as I share a data story, they'll say, oh, okay, that's interesting. I wonder what's happening in my part of the business, or I wonder what's happening with this. And, and what stories can we tell on that part? Uh, you know, if we've looked at one customer segment, are there other things that we can do with other customer segments to understand their needs and their interests? And and then I think that I, I think that yeah, I data that stories I was, fuel I was about curiosity. To halfway, when you were talking, I was I was thinking I, w I would like to know how you can make stakeholders who are not as available, who may be more senior or far away from you, who are hard to reach, but eventually make the decisions that you're. Um, that you're trying to improve or help with yep. with your data how can you reach them or how can you get curious with them how can you understand their perspective but maybe you answered this question already by saying you need to tell stories so you grab their attention is that right or do you have more uh, ideas how you can do that how you can reach these more senior people or people who are far away who are eventually making the decisions based on your data. Yeah, I think an important step in that process is to understand their business, their needs. What are they trying to solve? And in the book, I talk. I have a model that I introduced called the 4D framework. It's really based around audiences. And, and I said there's four key dimensions you need to understand for any audience to really connect with them. And, and the first one being, OK, I want to understand what the problems are that they're facing. Is there a, a top of mind problem or series of problems that they're trying to address in 2022? Uh, and then the next thing is with that, paired with that is, okay, what outcomes are you trying to drive? Like, you know, maybe they have a problem, you know, let's take a marketing example. They're struggling to generate leads for their organization as a marketing organ, you know, in a B2B marketing organization struggling to generate leads. Okay, well, what is the outcome you're trying to drive? Well in 2022, we want to double the number of leads that we're generating for the business. Oh, okay. So that's, you're going from 500 a month to a thousand a month or whatever that is. And then the other thing that the other, the third dimension that I want to understand is what actions or activities or strategic initiatives do you have in place to get you from your current state where you have your, this problem to your future state. And so, okay, what are we doing as a marketing organization? Well, we're changing some of the channels that we use. We're, we're shifting more to digital or we're going to be doing more virtual events. And so, oh, okay, so let's, let's evaluate how they're performing. What, what, are there opportunities to optimize those or are there other things you could be doing in those areas? And, and so I want to understand that. And then the fourth dimension is, is the metrics, the, the, the key, you know, we often we call them you know, KPIs or key performance indicators, but what are those key metrics that that audience is using to measure themselves by and measure the activities that they have? And so I think, you know, obviously the stories are going to connect with people, but if, if, our, if we don't have a good grasp of what the audience is caring about, obviously we want to have stories that are going to be meaningful to them, that are going to connect with them. And, and that's where if we can understand what problems they're trying to solve, what outcomes they're trying to drive, what activities they're investing time and resources in, and what metrics they're being held accountable to, that gives us a really great uh, approach that we can take to kind of build meaningful data stories for them. Because that's, I, I talk about it in my, my book that, you, sure, lots of businesses are collecting all kinds of data, 
And it's kind of like a labyrinth, right? We, we go into that labyrinth, we may or may not come out with something meaningful. And having a framework like what I just talk, talked about, obviously it's a simple framework of having those four dimensions, it, it feels like we're, we're handed a GPS, we're handed a, a map or a compass to go into that labyrinth and find meaningful insights that we could then bring out of the awesome. data yeah, and share it, it with our with understanding their perspective, right? And I think that's that also sums up what we in data, data professionals, can learn from people in marketing. Because people in marketing, all they do or all, all they start with, uh, they always start with asking questions about who is th who's the customer, right? What are the frustrations? What they, are they trying to achieve? And I think with this marketing or curiosity mindset, however you want to call it, I think we could uh, benefit greatly. We touched upon storytelling already a bit. What I'm curious about is because I've I've seen storytelling, data storytelling everywhere. In the last years, it's kind of a hype, right? Everyone talks about data storytelling, but from my perspective, there are a lot of misconceptions about what data storytelling is, um, about how the term is used and misused. So can you share your thoughts about it? Yeah, one of the things, uh, one of the frustrating things for me is that I do see uh, data storytelling being more than a buzzword, more than just jargon. And I've seen a lot of vendors and other people talk about data storytelling, kind of using it as a buzzword. And, and I think there's a lot of power behind that whole principle of, of telling stories with our numbers or with our data. And so one of the first uh, misconceptions I think that's out there is that a lot of people just associate data visualization with data storytelling and that it's a synonym for maybe good data visualization. That's all it is. And really that overlooks two other elements. In my book, I talk about there are three key elements to data storytelling that we have data, narrative, and visuals. And, and yes, visualizations are a big part of data, or data storytelling to the point that a lot of the data that we're sharing is very complex. There's a lot of complexity with the numbers. Um, and so when we visualize the data, we help the audience to see things in the numbers that they would miss otherwise because they wouldn't be able to see the anomaly or they wouldn't see the patterns or trends. Now I've had some people come back to me and say, is that even an essential element? Because they've heard good podcasts, you know, where people are sharing data stories with no visualizations. It's all audio based. Uh, and so I would say, I, I think visuals are still important. Are they essential? Well, actually, you could probably tell a data story without any visuals. Now, with that said, they, again, I'll say a lot of times we're sharing a lot of very complicated, intricate information, and it does, it can be assisted by visualizations. But really where a data story comes in is, is obviously having the right data and, and having a, a framework like 4D to kind of help you identify the right insights is crucial, but then the thing that I think gets overlooked a lot of the time is uh, the narrative element. And, and I was actually thinking of writing a, a post or a blog post about the difference between narration and narrative. And I, I kind of look at narrative as being much more than just narration. Uh, when you hear about data storytelling, some people will just assume, oh, I'm telling a story with my chart. I've added some annotations or I've got an, an explanatory title on it. And, and now my chart is telling a story. And I've even heard other people say, oh, every, every chart tells a story. You know, that, I think that really relegates or undermines really the power of storytelling. Storytelling goes beyond just what I would call a scene, which is one data chart. In my framework, I kind of view that as a scene in a story. You know, so that can be very, very compelling, very powerful. We've all watched movies where they've had these really amazing scenes but is it an entire story? It's not. No, it, often what I find is I'm gonna to have to use several visuals and, and different data to really tell a complete story. And so I think that's one of the misconceptions that's out there that yes, you know, people equate it with data visualization, but then also some people equate it with just adding in some text and some annotations and calling it good and you've told a story. No, there's a whole structure to how a story, what makes a story a story 
if we think about it in terms of the um, like an arc, a story arc, you can create a story arc for your for your data findings and, and form it into a story format, which then connects with people on a much deeper level, on an emotional level potentially, um, that you just can't achieve mm -hmm. with just facts yeah. alone or just visualizations alone. Yeah, I agree. That, that's also the biggest misconception I see that people assume that data storytelling is data visualization. Um, but indeed, a, a, just a graph and with some annotations is not necessarily a story. I think uh, where it starts to be become a story is when there's a problem, right? Or, or, or a character, or at least those are elements of a story. And it's quite hard to have that in one scene, in one frame, yeah. on one slide or one visualization, e even if you add these annotations. Right. Um, you also mentioned about a blog post, and also, also I want to ask about another blog post. You mentioned in that blog post, you talk about um, why data storytelling requires a mindset shift. You talk about story framing versus storytelling and reporting mm -hmm. versus storytelling. Talk to us about that and yeah, tell us what, what was the, the essence of that blog post. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people also associate, another misconception I think that's out there is that people associate dashboards as data stories. And, and I worked at a, at a company, Domo, you know, where they, they basically are a cloud BI solution and, and provide dashboards to companies. And I always struggled with that notion that we're telling stories in dashboards. Uh, and really it comes back to that whole it's a, it's a different mindset that we go through. A lot of what we've done today in BI and analytics is we've focused on generating reports and dashboards. And, and, and there's even some vendors and other people out there that are saying dashboards are dead, uh, you know, kind of being provocative that way. I don't, I'm actually not in that camp. I, I do see a role for dashboards and reports, and I think it will continue into the future because at the end of the day, I, I, I talk about uh, how creating an insight funnel, okay? And at the top of this funnel is really where the dashboards and reports sit. We're basically uh, observing what's happening in the business, right? We're, we're monitoring what's happening and we, we create these reports and dashboards to help us explore the numbers. And, and so I call that the story framing uh, because at the end of the day, it goes back to, you know, if I set up a dashboard all of a sudden I'm choosing the metrics, I'm choosing the dimensions, I'm starting to target where we're focusing our attention on. Hopefully we're focusing on the most important things to our business and, and, and they're tied to the priorities of what the company's focused on, but we're not, we're not bringing in all of our data into a dashboard. No, we're, we're handpicking the metrics and the dimensions that are meaningful to the audience that we've targeted with our dashboard. And, and so that's kind of the first step we start to, you know, and that's why I call it story framing. We, we're starting to uh, reduce all of the metrics and data that we can look at and really focusing on the ones that are really critical to the business. Now from that, we might then see a spike in a particular metric or a decrease in a particular metric or something that's happening. And then that gets us curious. And then we start to ask questions. Well, why is that happening? And, and maybe we can, you know, double, uh, drill into that information in the dashboard, or maybe at that point we need to kick out and go to an analytics tool, or maybe we need to work with an analyst or a data scientist to explore that problem further. And then at the bottom of that funnel is when we have an insight that we want to share with other people and we need their buy-in, we need their, uh, maybe we need resources, we need budget from them, maybe we need their, uh, their buy-in, different things from other people that's when we form a data story. We have an insight and we take that insight and craft, you know, um, an explanation of what's going on and also what we recommend that we do with that insight. And that's where we shift from being exploratory on the top of the funnel to actually being explanatory. And the goal at that point is we're trying to uh, move away from just observations to a real insight that then uh, will then drive a decision or, or, or change something. And that, that's, that's something I've also been talking a lot about lately. I think sometimes we use that term insight very loosely. And, and when I was writing my book, I found I really needed to, well, I had reviewers who gave me feedback, said, you're using insight a lot. What does that, what do you mean by insight? 
and, and I started to look at like dictionary definitions of what an insight is. And they were okay, but they really didn't help me understand really what an insight was until somebody shared with me uh, a quote or a definition by Gary Klein, who's a psychologist and author. And he, he basically framed an insight as an unexpected shift in the way we understand, we, we understand something. And for me, that was, ah, that's what it is. Because then all of a sudden it's like, okay, let's take an example. Uh, maybe it's a, a manufacturing example. Oh, this process we thought wasn't working because of this one step. And we've been trying to optimize on that one step. But there's some analysis or something we did, and it shows it, wasn't, it isn't that step. It's this other step that we have that's really causing all the problems. Well, what does that mean? That means, oh, we've been focusing on the wrong area the whole time. We've, we, need to, we need to fix this other step and optimize it. And, and so that, that could be, we're going to have to do changes within the organization. We're going to have to do things differently. And that any insight will then inspire change automatically or, or it'll demand change potentially. Whereas an observation is just, oh, um, here's something we, you know, this, this uh, metric went up, it spiked up. Okay, that's very interesting and unusual, but we don't know why. We, we just have the what. And, and so sometimes I think we equate observations with as were we mistaken observations for insights when really they're, they're not as actionable as an insight that if it's shifted right. our understanding, right. we have an urgency yeah, it, to it change to sense, address it, if that makes sense. According to that definition that you're just mentioning in your book, the unexpected shift, then we have way less insights because not all the observations or data points are actually insights, right? And you, you talk about... You know, what's the difference between reporting, dashboarding, and, and then storytelling at, at the bottom of the, of the funnel? What, what, what are your thoughts about, you know, having a predictive model or creating an algorithm and then presenting that to a group of people, a group of business people? Can we use data storytelling if yes, how? Yeah, I, I think so. I think we can still use, what, you know, how, what went into that model? What, what were the, how do we design that model, giving them enough context to understand it, and then how would we apply it? How, what are the insights or what are the benefits that we get from that model? So I think we can take uh, that approach and, and apply data storytelling. It might be slightly different where there's not an action that we're trying to drive or something like that, but it's just like we need to rely on this model and, and this is, this is uh, something that we're, we're trying to do. And a lot of times, you know, when I talk about data storytelling, data storytelling, I don't think you necessarily need to do data storytelling for everything. When do you need to tell data stories? And, and I was actually talking on another podcast with another speaker. And, and, and in my book, I have this quadrant where I say, uh, basically, there's, there's this one quadrant where you definitely want to tell a data story. And, and, and on the bottom axis I had, is it high value or low value in terms of the, the impact of the insight? So that's kind of like the one axis. And then the other axis I had where I said is, what, what type of insight is it? Is it a, a difficult or hard to follow or understand insight? Or is it easy to insight or process? And, and then I, I said, basically, if, if, an in, if an insight is high to medium value and it's also hard to understand or process, and, and that could be for different reasons. It could be because it's counterintuitive. It could be because it's bad news, right? It's like, oh, we spent all this money on this campaign and it's all been wasted. That's going to be a tough message. So there's, you know, there's the, some complexity as opposed to where... Maybe uh, an insight is easier to understand. So we did this campaign. It was a, a huge success. And we're going to be reporting back to the marketing team. Hey, all that money you spent was a success. I mean, that's going to be a harder sell. It's going to be an easier sell, right? And, and then what the, um, what the other podcaster noted is when there's an established narrative in the mind of your audience and your information just complements that, it just adds to the existing narrative. You don't need to tell a story. You're just adding new information to what they already believe. It's when there's an existing narrative that, oh, we're really good at, or that campaign was successful. 
or our customers like feature A, and we come back with like, no, actually they they like feature B, or that we are not as good at marketing as we thought we were. When we have a conflicting narrative, our data shows that we have we need to form a, a more accurate narrative that's conflicting with the existing narrative. That's when you need to tell a data story, and so it's it's really when you need to shift the narrative in people's minds. And, and that's when we engage. So in the case of that model example, if it's, if it's a model that everybody's expecting will work fine and, and they're excited about the model, do we need to really do a big elaborate data story for it? Probably not, because people are gonna be on board with it. It's only when it's like the existing model or the existing way that we've done things sucks and the only way we can move forward is if we embrace this new model. That's when you would have you would need to take the time to really build the case, right? You have to build the story around why that model is going to change the way we, you know, from a customer service perspective mm -hmm. or from so a if sales I can perspective, summarize, it's going to help us. You you mentioned you mentioned a quadrant, but high value, low value, and uh, difficult, hard to follow, or difficult or hard to follow, and e or easy to process. And talking about conflicting narratives in COVID, I don't want to make this a political debate, but what I'm curious about is there are a lot of different narratives in among people. And if you take a very black and white, there are two narratives, right? You should be vaccinated or uh, you should not be vaccinated. How do you think, how do you think the government, do you ask government or, right. or how, how do you see other countries dealing with this and do you think they would benefit from from adopting more storytelling what do you think because clearly they try to make people adopt a certain narrative namely you should be vaccinated um how do you how do you think they are doing and do you think they could benefit from more storytelling one of the interesting things that as i was writing my book i found um, some work by some climate change uh, researchers and they they've done some analysis or research into what makes people consider new perspectives or conflicting perspectives because at the end of the day uh, from a psychology perspective if I come to you with let's say you're uh, not you're against climate change you know you think all of it's just fluff and I came with some data and dropped it on your lap and said see Gilbert Climate change is real. You you got it. You're so you know you're so crazy. Unless that's never going to work because just dropping facts on somebody is not going to change their perspective. What you have to do is you have to not only include those facts but you have to package them in a story because you're going to have anybody has an existing narrative, and in the psychologists and, and the neuroscientists found a lot of times is when maybe one, one fact in their, in their narrative gets blown up by somebody. But what happened is the residual narrative that they have in their brains, they, they'll just start, oh, well, maybe that data is, you know, I, don't, I can't trust that data, it's, it's from, you know, so-and-so or whatever. And they'll just revert back to the narrative that makes them comfortable. And so it's really, how can we build a compelling narrative with our facts and, and really complete the whole uh, story so that people can embrace not only the facts, but the, the narrative that goes with it. And the interesting thing is that uh, in some of the um, research that, I've, uh, that I found for my book is that people found that visualizations are actually very effective at persuading people with very different political views, or you know, they used it for climate change, they used it for different uh, parties here in the US, and, and they, a visualization was actually one of the few things that got through to people, where they, could, they couldn't deny the data, they couldn't, they couldn't reject it outright. And so it's a delicate thing, you know, especially with politics and, and how uh, people approach it. Everybody has an existing narrative. If you think about conspiracy theories, right? It's it's they're so far, you know, they have to preserve the narrative, right. and they'll just embrace anything. Like it's 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 funny too. Like again, I, I just sorry, it's a very interesting topic because the thing is, is when we get data that supports our narrative, 
We don't scrutinize it. We just say, oh, yeah, there, right. there's the more proof bias, that supports right? my narrative, you know, and we don't even think about it. Unconsciously, we do that. Whereas if it's anything that conflicts with our narrative, all of a sudden we're very skeptical, we're on guard, we don't want to be tricked or deceived. And so once we, when we, when we shift into that analytical mode, we're going to be much more close-minded. And, and people, psychologists have even found when you have a threat to your ideas or your viewpoints, they looked at the uh, reactions that we have in our bodies and found the same way we react to a conflicting idea or, or perspective is the same way we react to if we ran into a predator in the wild. The same uh, defensive mechanism that we have in our brains uh, for a physical threat is the same way we react to a, a, a threat to our ideas or our values or our viewpoints. And so it is very tough to just break through with data. And I think that's where a story is one of the only ways we can really get through to people. And, and again, you know, it's, it's, it's no guarantee. There's a lot of people entrenched in this in their viewpoints, but it's, I would say it's one of the few ways that we can actually, if we craft it in a right way and, and with empathy and with compassion and understanding maybe we can break through to people who, you know, are, um, they're being fed misinformation, they're, you know, they're being fed disinformation. I mean, it's, it's really, and that was one of the, the challenges as I was writing my book, you know, seeing all of this play out, like the, the concept of alternative facts was something that didn't exist, you know, before <laughs> I started writing my book. And in the middle of my book, I'm like, oh my gosh, like alternative facts, are you kidding me? And so I, you know, there's a little mention of that in my, in my book, but, but this was all unfolding. I, I always, as a, as a, as somebody who grew up in data and always aspired to make decisions based on data and then seeing all of these, um, actions and, and movements kind of un, undermine all of the progress that we made with becoming a more fact science-based data-driven um, community or culture and, and then falling back into these uh, conspiracy theories and, and misinformation. And it, it's, it's crazy, you know, but I think, again, I think data stories are a way to get through to people. And, and if we do it the right way and, and we tell uh, these stories in an effective manner, I think we can get through to people at least yeah, way more effectively absolutely. than just absolutely. hoping that they'll and embrace the data. There seems to the be this alone. counterintuitive, thing that many people on data, they prefer the data, right? They prefer the rational facts. They should speak for themselves. But of course, in reality, they often don't. And I think we should adopt and, and agree and embrace the fact that emotions play such a big role in decision making. And by understanding and paying attention to other people's emotions and your own emotions and your own biases, uh, you're much more likely to convince other people and get your right. get your point across and yeah t coming back to your story about dropping facts i also remember a story of my cousin when she was 16 years old i was three years younger so 13 back then but i remember the story vividly because my cousin she was 16 years old and she was smoking and she was smoking early and her mother uh, didn't like it and Every other week, her mother, so my aunt, read yeah. an article in the newspaper saying how bad smoking is, with a lot of facts, how many people die, how bad it is for you, and how bad it is for your health. So every time she cut the newspaper, yeah. she, she cut the article and put and laid it on the bed of my cousin. So every time when she came home from school, there was another article full of facts why smoking is bad. And of course, like you just mentioned, she, she never adopted the narrative, right? It was just more facts and facts. And I don't think her mother um, tried to understand her perspective, asked questions, started with empathy and and using a story maybe to, to get on the other side. So I think this shows how uh, ineffective just dropping facts right. is. Then yeah, absolutely. we talked about data storing and telling a lot. And, we, we also talked a bit about presentation skills. What do you think is the role of 
presentation skills in, in data storytelling? And do you have any best practices that you would like to share? Yeah, I mean, there's there's different scenarios. There's the scenario where you're, uh, you've are you got an insight, you've built a presentation or a data story, and you're sharing that in person with your audience or via Zoom or whatever, but it's an in-person kind of uh, communication. Now, a very common scenario is I don't have an opportunity to share it with the people. I have to send it to them in an email or I have to basically put it up on an internet site and people have to consume it that way. So there's there's two challenges there. Sometimes people have to do both. You know, I've talked to different analysts and it's like, not only do I have to present it in person, I also have to then email it out to everybody else who wasn't at the meeting for them to kind of process it. And, and I think one of the dangers that we have in that scenario is we get, you know, we're trying to optimize our time. So we're like, okay, well, I'm going to take the version that I would email out to everybody and I'm just going to present that to the people directly. And one of the challenges that, that that creates is because you've got all of your annotations and all of your descriptive language and everything <laughs> in the slides, that makes for a horrible presentation. Because what happens is people will naturally start reading your slides. And meanwhile, you're talking over and saying exactly the same words. And so that would be one of my uh, recommendations to people to be very careful about that, that they don't present the version that they're going to email to everybody. Um, you do need to have annotations. You do have to have notes or whatever to explain the slides or the information to the people who aren't able to hear you in person. Um, but that that is a danger zone when you make that mistake. of Because at the end of the day, if you're just loading in too much information uh, into your slides and, and you're presenting it to people, you're going to lose your audience. They're going to they're going to start to multitask. They're going to start to tune out because they're just overwhelmed with too much information. So I think that's one key thing. Now, if you're presenting uh, information and something that I've learned in my career, and if you say you have a really big presentation where you've got this really great insight and you're presenting it to the C-level executives or the VP level at your company and you're excited about where this insight can go and, and different things. I think it's important to rehearse your presentation. I think it's important to get feedback from other people on, you know, here's my slides, let me present it to you, give me feedback. You know, you're not gonna do that for every presentation, but I think if there's a critical presentation where it's important to your career or important to the organization, it's worth that extra time to, to rehearse it and really get it down so you're, you're, you can do it cold and, and you're very familiar with it. Uh, it's going to give you more confidence. It's going to position you for success in presenting that information. But then also sometimes we're so far in the weeds and we, we're looking at our presentation, we're looking at our story. And then if I share it with you, Gilbert, and then you say, well, why did you use this color blue for this? But then you switched it to green on these other slides. Oh, I completely missed that. I, I'm so focused on the narrative or so focused on making sure everything's perfect that I miss those little details or, or maybe have, Hey Brent, have you thought of adding a client testimonial? You know, you talk a lot about the value that this is going to provide. It'd be great to have a qualitative exam. You know, little things like that can add a lot of value. I love getting feedback from other people when I have an important presentation because uh, it's going to round off those rough edges. And, and often I get great ideas or great suggestions that, you know, take something from being an eight out of right. ten to a nine or ten. Thanks out for of 10. sharing those uh, those tips, and yeah, they make they make a big difference. I I totally agree. And coming back to your first point about the different versions and presenting something and emailing the, uh, the the same slides, I've never met anyone who said I like text on slides. But still, especially in corporate settings, many slides are full of words. <laughs> Why, why do you think that is? Why why haven't we changed yet? Well, every right. everyone adopted the same narrative, the only correct narrative you have, you ask me. Slides are not supposed to be full of words. But still, in my experience, 70% of the slides are full of words. Well, why do you think that is? Why can't we adopt this different narrative or put in, pra put in practice what we think? I think a lot of it's just easier. I think it's easier for people to bang out their words, you know, explain something with bullet points or write a write a paragraph 
it's like that's easy to do. It, it actually to actually refine it and get it down to a succinct, concise, impactful. You know, that's going to take more more work, right? It kind of goes back to that. I think it was uh, Pascal who said, "I would have written mm -hmm. you a yeah. uh, a shorter letter, but I didn't have time." You know, something I'm paraphrasing. I think it's the same thing with a lot of the presentation slides. People don't feel like they have enough time to really put the effort into it, but they at least want to share the information, right? So they'll they'll hammer out a bunch of paragraphs or bullet points, lots of text, and then they, you know, there's the information. You know, they've got it. You know, is it perfect? No, but it's it's there. And and I think that's the problem. I mean, we we tune out. I've I've got back in the day when we could present at conferences. I remember. I would go by conference room after conference room waiting for my turn to present <laughs> on my content. And I'd just see these walls of text or I'd see these data diagrams from hell and what, you know, data pipelines going everywhere. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, like these people don't understand. Like they're, they're putting their audience to sleep. They're going to, they're going to retain about 2% of what they said and, and the 2% being who they presented and, you know, maybe the topic and that's about it. Uh, but it's it's a real problem. I mean, I think there's we we see a lot of complexity in a lot of the just the general data presentations that I see, and that's again that's not thinking of the audience. That's that's making my life easier. I can just data dump. I can just dump in the information, the text, and then deliver it. And that's that's all you're doing. You're just informing. You're not communicating. You're not helping the audience to understand what you're sharing. Because if you really truly wanted the audience to understand what you're communicating, right. uh, then you would not do a wall of text. That is not an effective way, uh, you know, and, and especially if you're presenting it. Uh, that's just, you know, <laughs> but it's, it hasn't changed in the 20 years that I've been presenting at conferences and, and I don't, I don't know what it's going to take, but, but, you know, I, I, one by one, if I can convince at least one person not to do that, um, you know, spend a little bit more time to make something that's actually going to communicate effectively and connect with people. Yeah, good. good. Uh, then I hope you're going to convince that everyone before victory. you retire, uh, Brent. <laughs> retire, uh, Brent. <laughs> it's a nice challenge. We uh, we we talked about a lot about your book, <laughs> which is excellent. A lot of great frameworks, and one uh, in particular. And I was I was wondering, what do you think about other storytelling or data storytelling frameworks and for example, what do you think about the pyramid principle where you start with the key message or the key insight first and then build the arguments after? What do you think about that for for use for telling stories with data? Yeah, that's one of the challenges I've run into because I think a lot of times I have people who, now let's review how does a data story work or how does a story work? You build up to a climax, right? That's basically what you're doing. You're not giving away at the beginning the climax of your story. And that's essentially what you do with the inverted pyramid approach where you're basically giving away. And so what do you lose? What, what, is, what is it that you give up? Well, you, you lose all of that emotional kind of build up, the tension, the suspense. There's a lot that you give up. And some people even call that inverted pyramid approach the anti-story because you're basically you're losing a what of that power. Now, I also had people who came up to me after I presented on my state data storytelling framework and said, I love this, but I, I'm not sure whether my executives will embrace it because they're used to having an executive summary and then going that way. And so I looked at my model. And I said, OK, here's my workaround. I, I call it the data trailer. And it's like a movie trailer, but it's the world's worst movie trailer. Because what I do is I basically say, okay, there's two elements that you take from my framework. You take the hook, which is uh, maybe you've noticed in your, it's a major observation that you've noticed in your data where there's like, oh, this metric went up or this metric went down. So you're going to get, you're going to pique their interest with that. And then you're going to jump to what I call the aha moment or the, the main insight that you have. And so you share that at the beginning in a very concise, uh, quick way. And the goal of that is not to give them the entire story. It's actually to pique their interest in hearing the rest of the story. So like a movie trailer, it gives away some of, in, in this case, it gives away more than just the, you know, a teaser. It's, it's actually giving away the, the whole climax. But, 
But at that point, then you have an executive or somebody who says, well, tell me more. And they invite you to tell the rest of the story. And so then you get into the other details and the solution or recommendations that you have. But it's, it's a way of, it's, it's kind of a way of working around this common approach today. Because I think, I was, I was thinking about why is it that we have executive summaries? Why is it that executives rely on an executive summary so much? It's because we haven't told data stories. We've done data dumps, right? We've done these data dumps. We've dumped a bunch of data on people. And then the executive is like, so what? So what do you want me to do? What you want me to make a decision? What? Give me the executive summary because I don't have time to go through all of these numbers. And so we've ended up with this kind of executive summary kind of approach. But that is not storytelling. We, we, we've neutered the potency of storytelling when we do it as executive summaries. And so my capitulation or my workaround is the data trailer that we peak their interest. We, it looks like an executive summary, but then it draws them into a storytelling mm -hmm. kind of framework. And so that, that's the best I can do. Um, you know, I think, I think that's going to be a common challenge. And then some cases, you know, we don't need to tell, again, it goes back to my model. We don't always need to tell data stories. Sometimes it's fine to just, here's the information. It confirms everything you already knew great you know there's no there's no conflict there's no problem there that that needs to be resolved it's right, like it's right. just green light but in other cases we need to stuff. change Thank perspectives you. right change their narrative and then it's more uh, more useful and I, I think we all agree that storytelling and data storytelling is really important right. how how can leaders stimulate the uh, the use of data storytelling or or foster uh, a culture of data storytelling, if you will, in their organization. Yeah, I'm going to be um, rolling out a white paper this year. I've, I've got some of the initial ideas, but, but how do you build a culture around data storytelling? And I think there's, there's a number of different layers, but I'll just give some of them. So one is obviously enabling people to have access to data, right? If people are not able to access the data for themselves, and we talk about self-service analytics and in different things, but if people are not able to get access to the numbers and the data that are relevant and meaningful to their roles or their teams, uh, that's a first kind of problem that we have because how can you tell stories if you can't access the data or uh, get into it? And then from there, the ability to be curious because at the end of the day, honestly, data stories don't happen unless somebody's analyzed the data. If somebody, you know, if nobody's analyzed the data, nobody's been curious, found something interesting that they want to share with other people, then there's really not going to be a, a data story. And so those are, if I'm looking at from a leadership perspective, you know, do I have people, uh, are they able to access the data? Do they have the skills, the training, the knowledge, the ability? And sometimes I look at analysts and that analyst role shifting in today's um, environment because in the past what would happen with an analyst you say here I need you to go analyze this go 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 find me the answer you know and that still happens today but I think that has to shift a little bit to where an analyst is more like a personal trainer they're working with these people coaching them on oh yeah correlation is not causation uh, or it could be like little things like that, but they're guiding them to become self-sufficient to some extent. Again, I'm not, I'm not envisioning everybody becoming data scientists or, you know, master analysts or anything like that. But I think there's some coaching, mentoring that is now a part of that analyst role. And so if you have the ability to access the data, you have the tools, you have the bodies to kind of help nurture that environment. And then I think giving people an opportunity to present data stories. So that might be on a, a weekly basis, monthly basis, quarterly basis, whatever it is for your organization, but saying, hey, I wanna learn more about our customers. I wanna learn more about our business processes. I wanna learn more about our, you know, whatever these areas are and inviting people to tell stories to, I wanna, you know, and these are opportunities for everybody to learn more about the business, learn more about um, prospects, customers, uh, what's working, what's not working. And so it, I think it just elevates everybody. But from a leadership perspective, I think it's giving people the, the tools, the people, 
and then the opportunities that the you know to go up on stage and, and, and present stories to the rest of the organization. And then from there, I think it just kind of it becomes secular in the sense that, oh, I hear this really interesting story. That makes me curious. Now I want to go explore this other part of the business and see what I can find and see what stories I can tell on that. Right. And, and people, then I people share are learning those from and each I inspire other as somebody well, else. How they tell a story, right? How, what type around. of characters they use, what, what, what is the storyline right. that they're using. So I think in that way, people learn right. and become more confident as well, more curious, more confident, and the ball will, uh, will roll. We're uh, nearing the end. Um, before I answer my last questions, I would yeah. like to do a rapid fire round. So some quick questions that you can answer uh, answer quickly. First question, what's your favorite place to travel? I love going to Japan. I have been to Japan several times. I was fortunate enough to take my wife on the last trip to Japan. But I love the Japanese people. I love the culture there. I love the sights and everything. Uh, in general, I love traveling yeah, everywhere. Very Europe is, is diverse, beautiful. Diverse background um, as well. We were telling Latin me. America, everywhere. Yeah. I th yes. Yeah, definitely. So I would say Japan, but, but I, I would be equally happily going to New Zealand or to Brazil or to Portugal or you know, cool. the UK, wherever. I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. I, I feel... I feel <laughs> I just want to travel again. I feel the urge that's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm sick of being right, right. Likewise, trapped yeah, we're, here in my we're office. About, uh, uh, swapping, swapping houses in uh, in the introduction before starting recording. Uh, next question. Yes. Uh, you have very big headphones. Do you listen to music while working? If you work by yourself, and if yes, what type of music? I really like um, some old school uh, electronica music, just for like chilling, relaxing. Uh, but I also have my alternative uh, favorites like Beck, uh, Cake, uh, Black Keys. Um, so I, I'm, I'm kind of eclectic, but generally I'm listening to um, kind of Great. I love the Black Keys as well. electronic music. And then for spirit. all the presentations that I, yeah. I've seen you do from your computer, from your remote location, I always see the, the posters. Um, yeah. Briefly tell about the posters and tell us right. when you're going to create your first comic book. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I grew up in the 80s um, collecting comic books. Um, and so I, I'm a big fan of Marvel, Spider-Man, um, Incredible Hulk. I actually have this comic. This one I don't have on my other shoulder. Um, but I have other comics around my office here. And, and so I, I think it's goes back to the visual storytelling. I think there's, I, I have a blog post I want to write about what lessons can we take from comic books and apply to data storytelling. So that's, that's on my to-do list. Uh, I'll, I'll get it done this year. I've, I've been meaning to get that out. Um, but I think there's lots of lessons that we can take from comic books. And I, uh, I've enjoyed the hobby and I've got back into it. I actually have my comic book stolen from me uh, when I, after I, just before I went into college, I We're had a stolen. bunch of comic books stolen from me, and it kind of soured me on the hobby because I'd look at my collection and see these these gaps in my collection where they'd stole my best comics. And so uh, about two or three years ago, I got back into it, and, and it's been hard to uh, awesome. to stop buying comic books and reading them. What's your them, so. uh, number one place, Fun. thing, or person you go to for learning? You know, like I, I really like LinkedIn. I really like LinkedIn because it, it either it'll be a gateway to somewhere where I can learn something, you know, where somebody's either done an article or a video or something. And so I right now I spend a lot of time producing my own content on LinkedIn, uh, but then also seeing all the great stuff that you and other people put out there. Um, and, and so I find LinkedIn is a really great place to kind of learn and, and, and be inspired by other what's people, one thing that's, other smart people. Uh, what's one thing about you that surprises people? Uh, probably well, that I, I have I didn't five know kids. That uh, that's kind of a shocker. No, nobody really has that many kids. We had twins on our last try. We had well, try, uh, twins on our last um, <laughs> pregnancy, so we kind of overshot our, yes. our goal there. But we decided to keep the, the extra twin. So No, but that's, that's probably I, – I also look – I'm I'm probably older than I look. I've always looked very young, um, right. but yeah, my oldest child is 23. Yeah, so you don't look that old. I'm 
I'm older than Then last the question of the rapid fire round. At what job <laughs> would you be terrible? Oh, uh, what job would I be terrible at? I think. I mean, generally, I'll give everything a college try. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do. I'm trying to think. The, the one job that I hated the most when I was growing up, I, for a couple weeks, I painted the outside of buildings. And it was with like this paint stucco crap. And it just got all over your clothes and, and, and they worked just like dogs. And it was, it was a horrible experience. And then they almost didn't pay me and my friends. And it was, it was tough. So, you know, working in that environment, um, painting, I don't think I'd be good at painting. I, I don't like getting all the paint all over everything and, and just, yeah. So that was a, a, a very short uh, career decision that I realized early <laughs> That's in my, we learned my lifetime by trying out. painting yeah, was not And we can thing. shake hands, by the way, because I'm, I'm very bad at fixing stuff around the house. And yeah. I moved into a new house with my girlfriend last year. And yeah, that's a discovery I, uh, I made again that I'm terrible yeah. at fixing stuff around the house. I want to go uh, move to the end. I want to ask you two more questions. The first is, what is one big yeah. Yeah, takeaway that you want listeners to to get or take away from this episode? What is something you would like to share as kind of a conclusion? Yeah, I, I really believe that data storytelling is an essential skill that everybody needs to, to learn. It's much more than just data visualization. Data visualization is a key component of um, every data story, but it is much more. And if we can craft the narrative for our, for our insights, uh, we're, we're gonna see people act on them. We're gonna see decisions being made on them because often what happens is a lot of times we, we find really great insights and then we share them, but we, we don't see any action taken on them and we, we get frustrated that you know, our insights aren't going places. And so if you're in, that, if you're in those shoes and you're finding that you're, you're obviously doing a great job with all the analysis and everything, but you're just not seeing your, your insights go to the next level and actually be acted on, uh, there may be an opportunity for you to work on your data storytelling skills and then see if that has an impact Great. on changing that. And the last question is, where situation. can people connect or follow you? Of course, I have this book here. Um, I would highly recommend everyone to, to get it. It's a small investment, but it's totally worth it. I, I read it uh, more than once, and I use a lot of concepts in my, in my training, in my workshops. It's a really good book, so, uh, so get that one. And apart from your book, what... Uh, what else would you like to share about your activities? Your, you turned to, into an entrepreneur. Where can people follow, connect with you? Yeah, there's two places, probably the best places. So one is on LinkedIn. Definitely follow me on LinkedIn, connect with me there. Love to connect with people who are passionate about data analytics and, and data storytelling. Uh, the other area is I have a website, effectivedatastorytelling.com. And so there I've got some, I'm just starting to get some blog posts out there. I've got a few on there already. Um, and then I also offer different services like workshops and uh, I speak at events and, and different things. So I'm, I'm always looking for new opportunities to uh, help different organizations with their data storytelling skills. And, and that, that's what I've been focusing on uh, over the past five five months of being an entrepreneur. You're fresh, um, but with a lot of experience. Freshly and minted, I also so thought about, you know, talking a lot about entrepreneurship, but we had such a good, good conversation about data storytelling and and COVID and how we can change people's narratives or just give data if data storytelling is not necessary. I think people can take away so much from this episode and I also learned a lot. So thank you for, for being on the show, being on the Mind Speaking podcast. Really enjoyed it and uh, looking forward to, to speak soon, Brent. Thanks, Brent. Thank you right. for the opportunity, Gilbert. It was great to be here. Do you want people to listen to your data and increase your business impact? Then take my free email course or do the quick self-test of your data communication skills. Go to mindspeaking.com and start learning today.